I am David Crane, and I'm Jeffrey Clarix, and we created the show Episodes, and, and Friends, and The Class, and, and Mad About You, and you're listening to our interview with Elaine Goodman on gogoodman.com.au. How has the... And this this is kind of strange because I know Episodes wrapped up uh, at the start of this year or towards the end of last year, but the the last season just aired on a streaming service in Australia. It just came up. So Stan is like a kind of competition to uh, Netflix here. So it's like Hulu or something like that. But if I can take you back, how has the wrapping up of episodes compared to the other shows you've been on? Jeffrey, you were with shows like Half and Half and The Class, and David, you were with Dream On, Veronica's Closet, Joey, and a little something called Friends when they all finished up. Do you ever get used to, do you ever get used to wrapping up a series? I think you should you should straighten out that you had nothing to do with Joey. I didn't. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Joey, Joey's just because we created the character. That's it. Oh, <laughs> that right. wasn't mine. Oh, okay. uh, <laughs> series. Yeah. Um, uh, how is it, you know, it, sometimes shows are canceled and you didn't want them to be. Like The Class is a show that Jeffrey and I did together, and we were heartbroken when they canceled it. Um, and then sometimes you get to pick, and in this case, we decided after five seasons that, you know, leave them wanting more, and that's a much better... It's still sad, but it's a much better feeling. Right. So, I mean, yeah, is it is it still emotional, no matter what the show is, no matter how long it's gone for? Is there still that kind of emotional connection that you have to something that you've created yourself? Or do you get times where you're, you're happy to just let it go because maybe you've had enough? Um, I would say... There are certainly there are every once in a while you have a show that you've really it's just it's it's it hasn't been the experience you were hoping it would be, so you're happy that it's done. Um, uh, but in a case like episodes, yeah, it was it was really it was it was sad just because even though we had chosen to end it, we loved the the. We love the actors so much, and we love the characters so much. It was really fun to write. What was also interesting is because the show went on to become a pretty big hit on Netflix, we we were rediscovered, and it was almost like people people were finding the show for the first time five years after we first started it. And and they were much more vocal about their appreciation. When we were on Showtime in, in, L, in uh, the States, we had a nice audience, but it wasn't it wasn't as big as we got when we went on to Netflix, and so suddenly it was sort of we were looking at the show through different eyes, you know, and it was it was kind of a little bittersweet. It was like, wow, if we had gotten this kind of attention before, would we have stayed with the show another year, perhaps? You've directed. And written for Matt LeBlanc now, well, through two sitcoms. I'm not going to include Joey just because you created the character now, David. <laughs> um, obviously, friends and episodes. What do you like about him in particular? And Jeffrey, did you need to be convinced of this viewpoint? Well, Je- Jeffrey, no, I mean, look, uh, I-, I always adored Matt, but Jeffrey also, I mean, Jeffrey had a lot to do with friends, and he actually knew Matt from before I did. They They had met. How many years ago? Oh, my God. We met in the 80s, believe it or not. Matt worked around the corner from my apartment in New York as a uh, counter boy at a deli restaurant. And uh, I remember him very well, and he remembers me. I mean, uh, uh, but when I saw him back then, and he was probably like 19, I, I thought, this guy is is not just a counterpoint. <laughs> there's something there's something about him that is a little you know standoutish, and and I didn't know he wanted to be an actor back then, but but it kind of fell in his lap from what I the, the stories he tells uh, that he was sort of discovered at a, his girlfriend's audition. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah. So years later. I saw him again, and I thought, I think that's Matt from the from the deli. From the deli, <laughs> and and I said to him, Did you used to work, you know, at a, at the restaurant Pie in the Sky? And he went, Oh my God, 
quarter pound of <laughs> potato salad. I remember. And so we had this big reunion, and and we've been we've been besties ever since. <laughs> it was just it was such a surreal kind of. I mean, what are the odds of that? And when you've worked with Joey Tribbiani for ten years, does it take <laughs> does it does it take a while to get used to seeing him play another character, even if the new character is an over exaggerated person of himself, or as an insider, is it easy to distinguish between characters and the actual actors? I uh, there was always a distinctive uh, uh, separation between who Matt is and who the character of Joey was, or even who Matt LeBlanc on on episodes was. He's really a fine actor and a, and a subtle actor. You know, my mother used to say, "Oh, he's an idiot. That 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 Joey's an idiot." And I'd say, "My, he's smarter than I am. He's the smartest guy I know." You know, that is not who he is. And it, it isn't. He's he's really adept at what he does. It's very impressive to see him kind of switch into that character. And we, when we were writing it, we absolutely approached it as a character. And when we pitched him the show, we he said, well, like when we first said, well, it's you know the character is Matt LeBlanc. He said, well, is it is it like it? You know, is it going to be me? And we were like, absolutely not. This is not a documentary. <laughs> this is a character. And we wrote it like a character who's nothing like Matt himself. And he played it. The and similarities were basically that he had appeared on a show called Friends. It was that Matt LeBlanc. But other than that, we really started from the ground up and, and created this this kind of self-involved, spoiled, entitled actor. Who finally got a job on a game show. <laughs> Who finally got yeah. a job on a game show. Exactly. Yeah. What made episodes special and memorable for both of you? Well, well I think for, for, for me, it was the fact that we wrote it entirely ourselves. We, we didn't have a, a writer's room. It was just David and I in a room and... Uh, we ground out every single word, every single episode in advance, and so you couldn't you couldn't turn to somebody and say, "I need a better joke here." But at the same time, you didn't have to listen to people pitch out mediocre jokes and say, "Oh, that's terrific," but maybe maybe there's something else. You know, we, you, it saved time in that you don't have to be as nice because you don't have <laughs> 12 people who are, you know, vying for your attention and, and wanting to please you. Uh, so so it was a much more hands-on production than Friends was or Mad About You or Half and Half. I mean, and, and that was kind of special. I mean, we did everything from choose wardrobe ourselves to help buy props to, to what else would you Well, say? and I would say especially Jeffrey because a lot of – that kind of, I mean, and which is why he ended up directing the final season because, in essence, he we had been sort of back, back. What do you call it? Like backseat driving the whole time because we had such a clear vision of what the show would be. And so it was. Uh, I agree. It was in some some days it was harder, but it was worth it because. It was it was just us, and it was much more pared down in in production uh, production wise as well. You know, when you shoot here, you've got hundreds of people on the set, and shooting in London, we had a third that many people. So it was much more intimate and much more laid back. And uh, you, I mean, we would work from like five thirty in the morning until nine thirty at night. There weren't unions and, and rules, and you you pretty much could do whatever you wanted and, and get away with it, which saves a lot of time <laughs> and money and apparently. a lot of money. It was a, it's also like a third cost to shoot over in London. At, uh, that, that said, we had to reproduce Los Angeles in London, which was no easy feat. And it, it, it's funny, and I, I've got a question a little bit more about this in a moment, but you said there's a third of the amount of crew members. Is that better in that you can kind of control the storyline, the jokes, the timing and everything? Or is it not as good because you don't get as much input? And if, and if you feel something works 
and maybe it doesn't work on screen, then there's not as many people to kind of help you try to mend it? Or do you have enough experience to know what's going to work on screen? Yeah, I think we, we, we you don't always know. I'm, but uh, I think the fact that the crew was smaller really had nothing to do with that. That's just, you know, anytime you, you know, you're doing anything creative, you'd like to think you can always predict what's going to work and what isn't, but uh, good luck with that. <laughs> but that's where editing comes in. I mean, that's the, the genius, the brilliance of, of being able to edit with a terrific editor. You can really salvage a scene that kind of just lays there that, that on paper was funny and, and, and touching and, and, and then you'll see it on film, and it just lays there, and you think, oh, my God, what do we do? We ruined it. <laughs> but you can, if you have a good enough editor and you, you are willing to put in the time, you can really craft the scene from from scraps and, and, and make it moving and, and, and yeah. funny. And so we, we relied heavily on our editor, who was a British guy who... Uh, would come over to the States every summer and work with us at our house, and we edited everything in our own house. Now that the series is finished, were any of the characters or situations loosely based on your own experience or people you know in the industry? Like, is is most of the show from your own experience? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think more from, like... In general, not specifically. I think, you know, because we decided we're going to create something. Um, I mean, God knows the sort of whole point of view of the show is based on all the years that we've been doing this. But uh, in in the same way that Matt LeBlanc isn't really Matt LeBlanc, uh, it wasn't so much just taking people who we knew and, and parodying them. Right. Did you? Although we did that as, as well. Yeah, we did occasionally. <laughs> there were plenty of people. A lot of people. A lot of the critics at the beginning said, "Oh, it's such an exaggeration," and the reality was, it wasn't an exaggeration at all. It, and and people in the business would say to us, "Oh my God, that's exactly what a writer's room is like. Nobody's ever captured that." Or that's exactly what these meetings with the network is like. You know, it's so honest. And or audition scenes. It really, all the stuff that we'd experienced, and and yes, we had to to write it and create, make it funny, but uh, that's true. Because when you're living it, it's not that funny. It's not I that think. funny. <laughs> but but yeah, it was. It's all based on things that happened to us and and things that people said to us that uh, agents and 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 executives and was was the part written for Matt LeBlanc. Yeah. Yeah. From the start, when we came up with the idea, we we thought, what what makes this funny? You know, because originally it's about you know uh, this successful British television show, you know, about a erudite um, headmaster who's you know it's it's Lyman's boys and and then the British couple brings their show to America, obviously, and uh, it's about how. Um, American television destroys their show, and from the very beginning when we were conceiving it, we said, okay, what's the worst piece of casting that they could be forced to do? And Because it, in England, the, the part of the headmaster was played by Derek Jacobi, or... or well, it was Richard Griffith, Richard in, Griffith in the pilot. In the pilot and what would be the most ridiculous kind of casting that this, the United States could impose on these writers? to destroy their show, and we both looked at each other and went, Joey. Yeah, it's got to be Matt. It's got to be Matt. <laughs> and so when we pitched it to him, um, we basically said to ourselves, if for some reason he doesn't want to do this, then we'll come up with a different idea. And he said to us at, at, at lunch, we took him out for lunch, and he said to us, I don't mind being the punchline if it's a funny joke. And to his credit, as we would we dug into it, and we just wrote some terrible things for his character to do. He never objected. He never questioned it. He's he's such a a good sport about it, and he understood. It's actually it's a really good joke, uh, and and the character then got deeper and richer as the series went on. It was 
So it, and, and we always knew it would. We he wasn't to a total buffoon. I mean, he yeah, that was early on in the uh, the first episode where he explains to Sean why the librarian shouldn't be a lesbian. You know, and then he basically says, "Look, if Rachel had been a lesbian, there there, there would be no Ross and Rachel. You, there's nowhere to go if if his love interest." He, is is a lesbian and he really knew the business and the, and we we showed him having a deep understanding of the of the yeah of 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 the industry and how it works and so the character was much savvier than than certainly Joey was and you know he does some dumb things and then it turns out no he's actually he does some he's really smart in a lot of other he's ways he's just very self-destructive as as a person, the, the character true, yeah. of Matt LeBlanc. I mean, he he would screw up his own situations repeatedly. He just made the same mistake. I mean, the fact that he was dating his stalker, for example. <laughs> I yes. remember that. <laughs> you know, I mean, he he just did, he did really self-destructive yeah. behaviors. Oh, in, in the last season, just the, the, the masturbation scene. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> in the yeah, I have to say Jeffrey gets all the credit for that, both as an idea because when he pitched it, I went, "Oh my God, he can't do that." <laughs> Jeffrey said, "Yes, he can. If we're going to do the box, what's the worst thing that could happen in the box?" Uh, would a scene like so, that yeah. be would a scene like that be acceptable on American TV, or is that where Netflix is good in that you have more freedom to do things like that if they're going to get a laugh? Well, that's why Showtime was good because. It, it, it's cable TV, and they encourage that kind of freedom. You, but you could never do it on network TV, at least no. not the way we did it. Yeah. Now, I have a bit more of a, a, a technical question now, comedy-wise, and it's because comedy is something I'm really interested in. I've read a lot of books, interviewed a lot of people, watched a lot of classic comedy movies and things like that. And I originally thought episode two was going to be the fir- the best episode of the season. And then I saw episode five. And the fifth season was, was great all round in terms of comedy style. But episode five, there was a lot of repetition almost to the point of annoying until you realize it's building up to Matt's mum and his father's partner arguing over like through two separate phones that that scene was unbelievable with its timing oh, great and the great. the other the other scene was the closing scene where Matt decides to throw his dad's ashes out to see himself the mood is really somber the music is slow as Matt takes his shoes and socks off on the sand he walks into the water opens the bag and all his dad's ashes just blow back in his face so firstly I want to ask, are classic physical comedy scenes like these consistently funny in rehearsals? And secondly, that final scene was was kind of strange for me in that I didn't know if I should laugh or feel pity for Matt finally having a connection with his dad. And I don't, I don't think I've ever felt like that before watching a sitcom. It's You've always been able to kind of distinguish it, even in Friends, and that had a lot of emotion in it. I've read a book where it, where it says it was kind of like a, a romantic comedy, so when you're making a sitcom, do you ever second guess or really discuss where and how to fit the more emotional and progressive scenes and whether you want them to be funny at the end or not? Well, we we knew that once, we, that once he he decided to, to dispose of the ashes, that, that it had to be real. It had to be legitimate. He had to, had to experience all the, the feelings for his father that he sort of pushed down all these years, you know, because they, they, they had a very um, conflicted uh, relationship. It was, there were, yeah, they had, I mean, it was, I was about to say it's a love-hate relationship, but it was mostly a hate it was relationship. Mostly hate. Yeah. And, and we thought, well, if he has to f- actually face this, just the fact that he's carrying his father in a plastic bag, you know, I mean, just the emotion of that, you know, how strange that is. And then to, to do what his father wanted him to do, even though he thought it was ridiculous about being buried at sea and, and all his, all of the conflicting emotions that he had, you know, just building all that up. And I, and I, it was very important to me that he really took his time taking off his socks and, you know, really build that moment. But as far as rehearsal, because it, it 
was such a uh, physical piece of business, you couldn't blow the ashes in his face more than one time. So it was really kind of like finger crossed, fingers crossed, let's hope that we get it in one take. And that's what he did. He did it in one take. Yeah. And thank God you also, I mean, we thought in theory this is funny, but you don't know until you see it. And thank God it was because, yeah, we couldn't have done it over. So how many takes was the phone scene where his dad's partner kept calling up trying to figure out who the, what an Uber driver was and what kind of car oh, well, he was well, driving? That, what's interesting about the way we shot everything, we shot everything out of sequence. So, for example, every scene that took place in Matt's house for every episode of the season had to be done the same day. In other words, sometimes we would be shooting scenes from the first episode, and then an hour later we'd be shooting episode five, and a few hours later we'd be shooting the, the finale. So it was like a basically like a like a five hour movie being shot. So so when we shot those scenes on the phone, months later we would shoot the both mothers separately. We would shoot Matt separately. I mean, it really is putting together a jigsaw puzzle because nobody, very rarely did we get the entire cast together at the same time. Months would go by between scenes. Yeah, for instance, this this scene in Matt's house with the phone call was pretty much at the beginning of the shoot, and it was the last scene that we shot of the whole series was that scene on the beach. So that was months later. So he would he would walk into the his den to sit down to watch the game with his father's ashes, and then five months later we would fly to Malibu and shoot him on the beach, as if it were that evening. I mean, so I mean, it, there's a lot of tricky stuff going on and a lot of organization and. And I would say it's also a testament to the actors that they were able to, like, sort of mentally remember always where are we, what just happened. Uh, it's it's uh, they were pretty fantastic that way, just technically. So when when you're so obviously I'm guessing you do you write the storyline before the season starts, or do you write each episode? You have the storyline and then write have each episode written before the before you start shooting no we had to sh- we had to write every single well we had to write everything before we started shooting well, that was right. our decision yeah because once the decision was made to shoot that way y- you have to have it all you have to know what you where you're going and what you're doing um and then we would still because and then we had a giant table read where the entire cast would get together and we would read through the entire season in one sitting and it was an all-day affair it was so much fun uh, we'd have a lunch break. Um, and so then once we, we'd heard it, we had a sense of what works, what doesn't. And thankfully from a story standpoint, we didn't change very much, but every day Jeffrey and I were rewriting lines and jokes and scenes, and we were adding scenes, um, while we were shooting everything else. Well, so it was quite quite intense so did you when you'd finished writing everything apart from the rewrites is the filming a little bit more relaxing because you've already got everything on paper and you just have to edit what you don't think works on the spot no, or is the whole there's... six months a year however long it takes quite intense it's all intense because first of all i think it's more like three and a half months uh-huh. and, and because we're on a very strict budget there's a lot of compromise, you know, for locations and, and the kinds of sets you could build and the kind of wardrobe you can afford. And so, so much of, even though the writing is hard, so much of the actual production was difficult as well. I mean, to the point where if if we're in Matt's uh, house and you see him standing in front of a palm tree, we could only afford one palm tree so that when you would cut to another angle, we would take that same palm tree and move it to the other angle. So it would look like, oh, there are two palm trees. I mean, so every single moment took some planning and thought. And And then when you get to stuff like the box, 
that was a that was like shooting uh, an entirely different show. It's like, and now we're going to stop for a week and shoot a game show. Um, uh, and not only a game show, but a coming attraction for a game show. Uh, uh, previously on the box, which was uh, which was as if they were showing scene snippets from five other episodes. So I mean, it was really quite a yeah, it, production. It was, it was a lot of planning. As cre- as creators, is it important to be fans of your own work as well as other people's work? Do you still sit down and watch reruns of Mad About You or Friends or episodes or any other classic sitcoms? Not consciously. I mean, sometimes we'll be flipping around and we'll we'll stop on an episode of of Friends, for example, and watch for a few minutes and go, "Oh, that's pretty funny." Or, or, or the opposite. Or the opposite. <laughs> uh, gee, that that's kind right. of <laughs> We couldn't stay 10 more minutes to get a better joke. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I think we're our toughest critics. And uh, also just as viewers, we don't watch comedy very much. I mean, every now and then there are a couple of shows that we do enjoy, but on the for the most part, we watch dramas and reality shows and and not that much comedy. So, so where do you do you do you, do you see that there is some aspect of comedy in these dramas? Like, where's your comedy mind come from? Well, I mean, I think you know our. I don't know where our comedy. Mi- I don't know where my mind comes from. But <laughs> uh, I, I would say, yeah. I mean, when we're working, we're. We're thinking of funny things, or hopefully funny. But I think things. we have an uh, we have an unusual view of the world. I think it's it's really about that, and just kind of this kind of skewed, um, just sort of a perspective, perspective, and, and, and yeah, an attitude, and that's just formed in childhood. I mean, you know, I, I <laughs> damaged people. Yes, I think it is. I think there's a lot of damage there, and that's that's why it it's. Most of our characters are, are damaged people. So that's the episodes part of the interview, but I want to just share something quickly. So about four years ago, I was lucky enough to interview one of the cast members of The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, and I, I don't quite know where I came up with this idea, but I think a year or two later, I interviewed one of the cast members of Frasier, and I came up with this idea or this goal, this aim, to try and interview someone involved, well, at least one person involved, in each of my top five favourite 90s sitcoms. And the one that I've been missing for a while is Friends, and that's part of the reason that I'm really excited about this interview. So I was wondering if I could ask both of you guys a few questions about the must TV era and complete my top five. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> how how much of getting the Friends cut, and that some of them are directed at Friends, some of them, but I've tried to include as much of both of you and keep them open as much as possible, so you can both have a good have have answers as well. How much sure. of getting the Friends cast right, do you attribute to luck? I mean, I've read a book about this as well. You and Marta had another show going on Fox at the time. I know Lisa Kudrow had been dismissed by Jim Burroughs once before when she auditioned for Frasier. Matthew Perry and Jennifer Aniston weren't available for the first casting call. Monica and Joey were out of two people. And David Schwimmer almost moved back to Chicago to focus on theatre. And even in Mad About You, we can... I've read about the chemistry between Paul Reiser and Helen Hunt. Is luck a bigger factor in gigantic shows like this than us fans would think? Uh, Shall I go? Okay. I I think it it is totally luck. I always liken it to Cinderella's slipper. I mean, finding that one exact person who will fit this part. And, And it really is that unique. I mean... It's funny because when when the character of Phoebe was was discussed, my thought was she sounds too much like the character of Ursula, you know that uh, on Mad About You and 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 then we thought, well, what if they were actually related, which is something nobody ever did. What if they were actually twins? And so she, because Lisa is so talented and so versatile, and and she just seemed perfect for the part of Phoebe, but then we had to figure out 
how does she play it so that it's actually a different character, but the same kind of free spirit as Ursula was? Going, oh, well, yeah. I think uh, it was... You know, I mean, well, Jeffrey was the one who said when 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 we were just starting to cast, he went, "Well, you have to, you have to." This is Lisa Kudrow. I mean, he just knew it. He was working with her on Mad About You, and he said, "This is Lisa," and um, uh, and she came in, and she was absolutely the only person. I mean, that's the thing when you talk about luck. You know, the the luck I think is rooted in in that person walking in the door because. She was the only person in the same way that Matthew Perry was the only person who made Chandler funny. Uh, we kept, Martin and I reached a point in auditions where we were like, maybe it's the writing, maybe the character's just not funny. And then Matthew came in and it was funny. And that's what happens, that one person comes in and connects to the material and it's like, Oh, thank God, because you really do start to, to question yourself. You start to think, well, maybe it's not funny. The fact that we've seen 100 people and nobody has made us laugh tells us it, it can't just be that there's – it's, it's got to be the writing. It's got to be the writing. And then that one person will come in like Kathleen Rose Perkins – or uh, or um, Tams and Greg, Tams and Greg who, who read the same piece of material that 30, 40, 50 really fine actresses had read. And suddenly, oh, this is funny, yeah. and she's a person, and I believe this. Uh, I mean, and, and you have that, oh, well, there we go moment, where you're just like, oh, there we go, but, done, but done. Th that said, there are also times when you write a pilot, and you cannot find that person. And you know it, and you you feel from the beginning, I am compromising, and this woman is a lox, and she's not getting the laughs where she should be getting them. I don't know if you have locks over there <laughs> in Australia. I'm but not quite sure a, what a lock is. <laughs> lox, lox is bagels and lox. Do you it's have a fish? Oh, we have, it's we a have smoked fish. salmon. Smoked salmon. Yes, oh, yeah. And, and Definitely the, have yes, bagels. The expression is, yes, yeah. so it goes, on, it goes on the bagel. Uh, but um, you... you Ugh, the expression is, ugh, that person's a lot. A lot. It's just like a dead in. fish. It's, yeah, just like a... It sounds like lobby. a Yiddish word. <laughs> it is it a Yiddish word. word. <laughs> Maybe. It is totally a Yiddish word. So, so anyway, so yes, you, you very often, you, the magic doesn't happen. And, and More often than not, the magic doesn't happen. I mean, we have been so lucky. Be, I mean, there have been times when we've cast the wrong person, and for then one reason or another, they can't do it. And then with like a day to go, you find the right person who you couldn't, you didn't see before. And you, I mean, uh, Jennifer Aniston came in and we were just like, well, oh, there you go. And we had been so close. The network had made us offer the part of Rachel to someone who we didn't think was right. And amazingly, she turned it down. And then Jennifer came in, and you you just feel so. But lucky. then Jennifer was also already on another show, and it it meant that taking a chance to put her in your pilot, knowing that her other show might become a, a hit, in which case we'd have to recast her. So you know, you never know. I mean, we've been on a show where. One person finally comes in for a part, and you think, she's really good, she's very facile, she's funny, she's just not that interesting. And then we'll see somebody who really is quirky and interesting, and it doesn't work, even though it's a more, it's a, it's a more complex way to go. The public doesn't respond to it. They'll say, "What? What does she have a speech impediment? What's wrong with her? Is she slow? Is she?" And and in your heart and your gut, you think, "No, she's a much better choice." But you. So that's what I mean about it being a crapshoot. You really there's so many elements that that are in in play here to to get that magic in the bottle. And the, and then finding the combination of all the right, I mean, and that's why I feel so lucky because first on, on Friends and then on episodes we we found the right group of people and it's and there's not a there's not a false note among them. I mean, they're 
all great. And the odds of that happening are so slim. Which is why there are not a lot of good shows on the air. At what stage during the process of Friends did you realize you were on a gold mine? I've read for Marta it was the first run through where all the actors were together. Do you remember that moment as well? But what was the moment well, for you, David? Mine, I would say, there's just I think in that first run through we did have that feeling of oh my god, there's really something special here. But it wasn't until we started doing episode doing the episodes of the show and seeing how people were responding. It was that night in the restaurant. Yeah, I mean, Jeffrey and I always talk about it, it was probably about uh, two months into the run, and we're out to dinner with my parents, and Jeffrey goes, shh, shh, listen. And we listened, and th- the next table, they were talking about friends. They go, oh, my God, did you see the one uh, in the laundromat? And Jeffrey said, okay, you have to remember this moment, because this is the moment when you have to realize People are talking about it. It isn't just a show people this is, are watching. This is how you knew, oh, my God, this is this is big. But, you know, don't forget, at the beginning, you, you tape the show for a couple of months with an audience that has never seen these characters before. So you're not getting the kinds of recognition. You know, the audiences know why Ross speaks a certain way, and when he does, this is the result, or or that Monica is a certain way. So you're 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 really kind of shooting in the dark and and yes the audience responds but they don't respond the way they will once the show airs and becomes a hit. Then they come in loving the characters in advance and bringing that element to Yeah, where you can the, where you can just do like a character joke that that's where the laugh is entirely based on how well the audience already. If somebody the puts their shoes up on Monica's couch, you know how Monica is going to respond. Yeah. Or like, so or like was, when when they when they're having the competition for who gets the big apartment, and and Rachel right. comes up with the answer that that Chandler's like a transponster because there's a whole joke that we have no idea what Chandler's actual job is, and Monica's right. like, well, that that's exactly. not a word. Right, yes. exactly. Yeah. And had you not seen the episodes before that, you wouldn't have laughed as much. And that's what was happening. Is we had spent a couple of months with audiences that were very uh, uh, acknowledging, acknowledging yeah. but they, they, didn't, they didn't go crazy. They didn't know the cast yet. Because it hadn't been on TV It yet. hadn't been on, on the air yet. So you have that. And then shooting episodes without an audience take some adjusting too because things that you know in your heart are funny nobody's laughing at and you've got to think well do you pause because this is this is where a laugh should go or do you just go right past that spot yeah matt matt said the first time he did his first scene on episodes and he'd only done multi-camera with a live audience and suddenly he was doing a scene and there obviously there are no laughs because the crew is working very hard not to laugh. And he said it was really disconcerting. He thought, have I lost it? And then we finished the take and everybody laughed. And he was like, oh, right, that's how this works. You know, uh, uh, and it, 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 it's funny because I've, I've read um, Warren Littlefield's book, Top of the Rock, and there's a lot of quotes from you in there, David, about friends. And I got to interview him and he said that the moment he – he remembers is just being in the supermarket and just eavesdropping at late at night and just eavesdropping on people's conversations that they were talking about all these shows in the must see TV era. And that's when it hit him as well. So that was a similar ex- experience for you in the restaurant. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Favorite cameo appearance you've both written or directed for. I'll say, I mean, you're talking about like a guest star kind of a thing? Yeah, so like Robin Williams or Billy Crystal coming into Friends or David Schwimmer yeah, no, coming into episodes. Probably, it would be probably be Brad Pitt coming yeah. into Friends just because <laughs> it worked on so many levels, uh, you know, because um, just that here's this guy who hates Rachel and they had just gotten married and there was all this attention. And so, and he had never done this kind of thing in front of an audience. So that was exciting. And he was so good. So I would have to, for me, that probably 
Jeffrey looks like he's got a thought. I just remembered, yeah, we, we had uh, Gilbert Gottfried in, in uh-huh. season five uh, on the, the box. He was... Uh, of episodes. Uh, on episodes. And and I'm a huge Gilbert Gottfried <laughs> fan. And I don't usually fan out, but I really did in this case. I was just in awe of his brilliance. Even I grew and up I, with Gilbert Gottfried on Aladdin. Sure. Oh, exactly. of course. And you just see his stand-up stuff, and it's so yeah. funny and dangerous and smart, and he turned out to be a lovely guy. <laughs> yeah, well, it's just, that vo- is that voice real, can I ask? No, no, that's the irony. I, I really? mean, we wrote, we wrote all of his stuff, and he was doing our... In- our take on what Gilbert Gottfried would say, which is really weird, <laughs> you know, and you keep thinking, maybe you can say something on your own that'll be funny, but he's not, he's, I don't know if you've seen the documentary about him, No. but he's very introspective, he's very painfully shy, he's, he's almost on the spectrum in a weird way, you know, and, and, but then the camera goes on, the light goes on, and, he becomes Gilbert Gottfried. You know, it, yeah. it just like he turns it on and off. And it's amazing to me. I was just, I was thrilled to have him. I was just so excited about working with him. And and through the years, I mean, there have been lots of people that you think, oh, my God, I'm look at me. I'm working with Elliot Gould or I'm working with... God, all those people are mad about you. Mad about you, with? Cal yeah. Burnett or Jerry Lewis, Jerry Lewis and uh, you know uh, Carl Reiner or Mel Brooks. But when they're there, they're just people, and and they have their own proclivities and their own problems and their own insecurities, and and some of them are are what you were hoping they'd be, and some of them aren't, and you so you feel like you're also protecting them. You're trying to make them look as good as they can look. It, it, it's it's very interesting when when you're actually in it. When you've been a huge part of that must see TV era, and Friends and Mad About You were big plays in that era. What's the drive to stay in the industry, knowing you've hit that unimaginable peak? Do you get that sense that you can relax now and do something that? that you really you really want to do you you may have really wanted to do friends but you can maybe relax a little bit more because you've hit that peak and that's that's just a crazy peak that n- n- probably no one can hit that n- can hit these days because there's well, so many other these options days, no you're totally right because to the, these days you you don't even aim for that but, well, that said, you never aim for that. You do the best work you can possibly do and hope that it becomes as successful as it can. But even big successful shows, there are only a handful of known shows now. Sometimes David and I will be kind of scanning through Netflix, and and I'd say 80% of the shows we've never heard of before. Right, or you'll hear about some show that's been on for three seasons, and you're, you know, you'll see a, in here in L.A., you'll see billboards for things, and they'll be like, back for the third season, and we're like, I've never, not only have I never heard of the show, I've never heard of the network it's on. They'll say, oh, it's on True TV, and I'll think, what's True TV? Yeah, and they have these names, and you're like, how do I find it? Do it's I on Glob. I need a nap for this. It's just, we feel like, you know, the world has passed us by, but... I I wouldn't say that you ever really relax because I think we're insecure enough that whatever we're working on, we're like, it's not about how many people are watching about, is it funny? I don't know. Do you think it's funny? I don't know. Is this terrible? I think it might be terrible. And so I think that anxiety and that... And does it bring us pleasure when, when you create something? Do you feel that sense of... Oh my God! This is I like this. This makes me feel good. I'm getting that feeling when when a joke works or when a character feels honest or a scene lands. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's the process is no different. And for us, it's it it is a little different in that we're in our own little bubble. We don't go to an office. We don't work with a bunch of people. We do everything by ourselves at home. At home. <laughs> Having again, b- having been a part of that era, is there a part of you that's thinking about longevity when you make a new show? Are you thinking about the show being rerun twenty or thirty years after it's finished, or are you mainly focused on the audience that's watching it? You're focusing for the on first Friday time? night when you have to tape it. 
that's that's what you focus on. It's it's there's it like a somebody's got a stopwatch and you have to make it to the end of the week and shoot that show and cross your fingers and hope that yeah. we call it pencils down writing. You know, pencils down wherever you are. That's where you are, and you certainly it's. Your your eye is just on is this scene working? Not will this be here in thirty years? Can you, you can as Jeffrey was saying? You can't plan for that. You can't even hope. If that's your goal, you will forever be disappointed. Uh, if if your goal is, I think that scene works. You you might have a chance. Or when you say things like in episode five of season five that you had that reaction, that makes it all worthwhile for us. I mean, it's you know, people like you who say things like that, and you think, oh, so he got it. Yeah, and especially because season like season, episode five of season five is our favorite episode. So the fact that you like connected with it, that's worth it. Oh, <laughs> well, no, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it's just like it just went to a whole new comedy level, and it, it, it's crazy because a lot of it was like a lot of episodes has been about drama, and it's like that that real life that some, a lot of it's funny, but some of it's more about kind of the drama side of the industry. But season five just like up the comedy level insanely. Well, and in terms of how we like to write, we'll very often try to write a scene, if it's a dramatic scene, we'll try to find some funny way to undercut it at the end, or if it's a really funny scene, we'll very often try to find something surprising and poignant that undercuts that at the end. So, And I think that episode really epitomizes sort of that. Can you tell me about the power and the foresight of Mr. Jimmy Burrows when he took the six actors from Friends to Vegas, gave them some money to gamble, and told them they'll never be anonymous ever again? What went through your minds? Uh, Why wasn't I invited? (laughs) But the irony is when we were doing the class with Jimmy years later, he did the exact same thing. So it, it kind of lost its impact. Oh. It's like, oh, so he brings he just brings a whole bunch of kids, and said, and he said the same thing to them. He said, "This is the last time you'll be anonymous and enjoy it and look around." And, and we thought, oh my God, maybe it'll happen again. But no, it, it, again, it is Cinderella's slipper, and it doesn't happen often. And when it happens, listen, Big Bang. When we came on with the class, Big Bang had already been dead. They had done a pilot, and it died, and the network hated it, and it went away. And then when our show started to tank, tank is the word I was looking for, (laughs) Uh, also a Yiddish word, Um, (laughs) when when our show started tanking, they decided to reshoot the pilot, and they recast it, and they reshot it, and lo and behold, it became the Big Bang Theory Theory, uh, for 12 years. You know, but nobody knew. Uh, CBS would say to us, "Oh, it's terrible. It's all nobody knows. You don't know. You can't guess. You don't know who's going to respond to what and why." And I will going back to Jimmy. I will say I think his genius is not in taking the cast to Vegas. I think his genius is um, he he really understands writing. He understands material. He also just in some just primal way understands comedy and how actors work and he'll he'll sometimes he he doesn't watch he just listens he's like he's not he has no monitors he's not even looking at a monitor and he's just like listening to the music of it and if something is just off he'll have them he'll stop the scene immediately and says go back do that again um he's he's really remarkable that way um, and and he'll come up with little bits of business. And what's great about Jimmy is he'll say, fifty percent of what I've got is great, and fifty percent is crap, and you have to decide which is which. And he's pitching out stuff that you'll go, oh my god, he's Jimmy Burrows, that's terrible. And then he'll he'll come up with something that is so genius, and you're like, oh right, he's Jimmy Burrows. What are your favorite memories of the Musty TV era? Is there some like an interaction you had with someone or seeing someone or seeing someone's reaction? Is there something you remember from 20 25 years ago that's just stuck out that you can't forget? I to me, I remember when when the friends suddenly became superstars 
and that if we were going out for dinner with them as our friends, they would have bodyguards and we would be taken down to the basement of the restaurant and then through the the kitchen and then up the back stairs and 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 it was a, I've never seen that world before. I'd never seen anything like that before. And so that was pretty amazing to to watch firsthand six people become superstars and they they did. They all became superstars virtually overnight. Yeah, I do remember the end of the first season when we'd been just working and working and working and working, and finally the season ends and Jeffrey and I are going on vacation, and we look at the magazine stand in the airport, and they're on the cover of Rolling Stone. Uh, you know, it's like, how did that spin? We just started. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, and I have to say, for me, probably, Jeffrey was already on Mad About You, and I looked at that Thursday night lineup, that musty TV lineup, as kind of, I mean, that was just in the stratosphere, and I thought Mad About You was so brilliant, and Seinfeld and Frasier, and then when they put us on Thursday, when we got the call, it's like, we're picking up the show, which was enough. Like, oh my God, they're picking up the show, and then they said, we're going to put you on Thursday night at 8.30, and we were we were terrified, and um, at the same time, it was just it was it was like winning a lottery ticket. And the final question before I ask you what's next, something I always ask comedy writers or comedy creators because it gives me an idea. I usually ask it at the start, but I wanted to start with episodes. What's the earliest memory both of you have of comedy having an effect on you? Like, what's the reason you're in comedy today? I don't know. I don't think there was a, a certain yeah. thing. I just know that I I grew up being funny, and I had a kind of a, a, a warped sense of humor about things, and that's just who I was, and that's lucky for me uh, how uh, my my <laughs> career <laughs> turned out. I mean, I've just... I would... I, 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 as a kid, I was kind of ostracized, and 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 I was very shy, and and didn't have a lot of friends, and and but I would, but it helped shape who I am, and that's what I use now to yeah to write. That that person who was shunned is is the one who comes out with all of these characters and these ideas and. Yeah, words. I, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't really have a a defining moment. Uh, I don't think. I mean, I I didn't even know until college that I wanted to be a writer. Uh, I stupidly thought I wanted to be an actor until about my the second year of college, and I realized I wasn't very good at it. Um, and and Marta and I met in college, and she, we started out. We directed a play together, and we're like, "Hey, you want to write one?" And neither of us had written anything. And so we just kind of fell into it. So it wasn't ever like a dream or a goal. I just in college, we're like, hey, let's write a play. Okay. And so we did. I do remember in grade school and, and high school being able to make people laugh. And the feeling was like warm molasses. I mean, it was just like this kind of, you just felt like, like a heat go through your body and it, and 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 suddenly people were looking at you differently and suddenly you realize oh i i can just say what i'm thinking and it comes out funny to people and that's that's kind of a a nice little power thing to have <laughs> but it's true and that and you think i want to do this all the time i i'm going to use this to 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 reach my my goals my fantasies all right what what's next i don't think i'm particularly <laughs> funny so uh <laughs> i never had in that. fact we had a line in episodes where matt turns to to sean and beverly and he goes he's the funny one <laughs> yeah and i i definitely have never felt like the funny one i'm i'm always surprised that um i'm writing things that are funny because they don't feel particularly funny What's next? Are you gonna are, are both you gonna write another show together, or do you want to try something different? We're working what, on some what, stuff. We, well, we have always three working. Ideas. Always working. 
Yeah, not not enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy. It's easier not. That's to why work. we're so happy to talk to you. It's yeah. an excuse not to. Think we're not writing about the show. <laughs> we're not writing. Uh, but yeah, we have a we have some ideas, and we're we're playing with them. And uh, you know, um, when they're when they're they're ready, we'll we'll take them out of the bubble. I look forward to them. David and Jeffrey, thank you so much for talking to me, for for completing my top five. This is unbelievable. Here we go. And I posted <laughs> it on Facebook last week, and I got, a, well, <laughs> I got a lot of shit for not having Seinfeld in my top five. But no, I have definite reasons why. It's just outside, but I've completed my top five, and it's very there hard to get to interview someone from Seinfeld. So, so we're, we're your Cinderella slipper. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You're the one that I needed, and... I finally did it, and you didn't let me down. It was a lot of fun talking about episodes, which I love as well, and the Must See TV era. So thank you for spending so much time with me, and I look forward to what you come come up with next. Can't wait to hear it. Absolutely.